angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. I want to join us in singing, O come, all ye faithful. <coughs> church and um, on behalf of our entire church family we thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today and we exist here at Brooms Island Community Church to be the transforming presence of Jesus Christ in the 20615 zip code and beyond that's right um, I have one announcement to make and then we're gonna have our, a greeting time which is just traditional here for us at Brooms Island Community Church 
And then we're going to go into a time of prayer and worship. Um, and so my, I have my one announcement is that we're having Family Sunday and a baptism service next Sunday. So New Year's Eve, we're going to have at least one baptism for sure. So we're going to set up a portable baptismal right over here. And, um, but it's going to be a great service. The kids have been working on a song in the kids' class for two or three, yeah, two, two months. And it's going to be good. They're going to bring the energy. So make sure you show up for that. It's going to be a great day. Nice way to spend the end of the year together. All right, so that'll be next Sunday at 10 a.m. And now let's just take a minute before we get into worship and just stand up and let's greet one another. And then we'll get into prayer and worship. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. I'm going to go ahead and pray right before our time of worship, and then we'll go ahead and get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much just for all the people who are gathered here in this room, Lord. We're here to remember what you did for us, Lord, humbling yourself to come as a baby, Lord, to experience humanity as we are experiencing it, Lord, to show us that there is a way to do this life well. We thank you so much for the gift of his dying on the cross, Lord, the way of salvation for us so that we can be united with God in heaven. And we thank you so much, Lord. We're just so full of joy and gratitude today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All right. Please stand and join us in singing Angels We Have Heard on High. <laughs>
made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Join us as we sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee. place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Child is there. 
hace visible. image of God, forgiver of sin, bringer of peace, savior of the world, son of God. These are all titles, descriptives, and references regarding Caesar Augustus. I see some surprised faces, but this is true. Caesar Augustus was the first Roman emperor. He was responsible for converting Rome from a republic into an empire in 27 BC. And under his rule and reign from 27 BC to 14 AD, Rome was the dominant force on the world stage and had in fact conquered most of the known world. And perhaps more than anything, during his rule and during his reign, Caesar Augustus was heralded by Roman citizens for ushering in what is known as the Pax Romana, which means the peace of Rome. 
The peace of Rome represented an age. It was an age of stability. It was an age of peace in Rome and abroad. So yes, those words that I read, those words that appeared on the screen are words that were actually written about Caesar Augustus before Jesus was even born. The idea of the peace of Rome and this person, Caesar Augustus, were so intertwined that Roman citizens, citizens worshipped Caesar at the Ara Pacis, which stands for the Altar of Peace. And this is actually the Ara Pacis today in a museum specifically built just for it. Originally, the Ara Pacis was built just outside the main city walls of Rome. And the Roman citizens worshipped Caesar as a god. It was Caesar Augustus who implemented the imperial cult, the worship of emperors as gods. But they worshipped him specifically as a god for being the one in their eyes who was responsible for bringing peace to Rome and the entire world. And they actually had faith that as long as Caesar reigned, they and the entire world would experience peace forever, everlasting peace. Think about that. But how did the Romans understand peace? What did peace look like to them? I follow this really wonderful biblical scholar. His name is Brad Gray, and uh, he does a series called Walking the Text, and he had this to say about the Roman idea of peace. He said, you either submit to our rule, or we're going to put you on a cross. Or we're going to put you through some other form of torture in order to get you to kneel to our authority. So the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was imposed. It was a peace that was imposed by military might and power. And sure, while the citizens of Rome enjoyed this age of peace and prosperity under the rule and reign of Caesar, the rest of the world, they lived under the brutal reality of Roman oppression, or they lived in direct conflict with the military machine that was Rome. Now, sure, some of these conquered nations were able to continue practicing their own customs. They were even able to practice their own religions. But if they failed to pay their taxes to Caesar, or if they stepped out of line at all, they would be crushed by the iron fist that was Rome. In either case, whether they were living directly under oppression or they were in direct conflict with Rome, in either case, peace was not the real reality at this time for everybody on earth. And it certainly wasn't the reality for God's chosen people the Jews. The reality for the Jewish people was a life almost constantly under the oppressive rule of another foreign kingdom dating back to the latter part of the 8th century BC. So we're talking nearly 700 years of oppression and being under the foreign rule of a foreign country by the time Caesar Augustus is conferred as emperor of the Roman Empire. All the while, living under the oppression of foreign nations and empires, these Jewish people were holding out hope. They were looking forward to, and they were anticipating the coming of the Messiah that God had promised them through the prophets. Yet after nearly 700 years, think about that, after nearly 700 years of foreign oppression, the only savior of the world, the only bringer of peace on the scene was this emperor. The emperor of the very empire that was oppressing the Jews. And it was at that time. It was at that time that a baby was born. In a seemingly insignificant 
little town of Bethlehem in the hill country of Judea, almost in complete obscurity. While Caesar Augustus was ruling and reigning the Roman Empire, this baby was born. And that baby would be called Jesus, which means the Lord saves. Of course, Jesus was no ordinary baby. He was a little baby God-man. A little baby God-man. A little baby God-man. He was fully God, and he was fully human. He is the forever king. He was a king heralded by angels, proclaimed by lowly shepherds, and he was honored by wealthy wise men. The angels came and they announced to the lowly shepherds in the fields that Jesus had been born into the world as both Savior and Lord. Not just one or the other, but both Savior and Lord. And then the lowly shepherds, after finding Jesus lying in a manger, just as the angels had told them, they couldn't control themselves. They went out proclaiming the good news about the birth of the Savior to all that they could find. They're our first evangelists. And then the wise men came, and they worshipped this little boy as God. And they honored him as king with their gifts. Catch that. Not one or the other, but both. God and king. No, this was no ordinary baby. And this wasn't just an ordinary time. The year of Jesus' birth, it wasn't just any old year. The month of Jesus' birth wasn't just any old month. The day, it wasn't just any old day. Even the very hour, the very minute and second that he was born into the world, it was not ordinary. There was nothing ordinary about this time. In fact, this time was ordained. According to the Apostle Paul, this specific, extraordinary time that Jesus was born into represented the fullness of time. And the fullness of time really just means that it's just the right time. Now, a quick story. I was making gumbo last night. That's going to be our Christmas dinner. And a good gumbo starts with a really good root. So the roux is the base. It's what thickens it up, but it also gives it its flavor. And it's just two simple ingredients. It's some flour and some kind of fat or oil. I used baking drippings. Thank you, Mimi. We used baking drippings and some flour, and I started the roux. Now, if there's anything you know, or maybe you don't know, about making a roux, you can't take your eyes off of it. It's like a two-year-old child. You can't leave it alone or it's going to get in trouble. You have to stay there with it, and you have to stir it constantly. And you have to watch the color, because if you don't stir it, it's going to stick to the bottom and it's going to burn. And if it burns and you continue to make your recipe, that whole thing's going to taste like burntness, if that's a word. I don't know. It's going to taste bad. So you have to stay there with it, and you got to stir it, and you got to mix it. And you can't walk away, at least not for too long. And you got to keep an eye on that color. And for my gumbo, I like a peanut butter colored roux. That's what I, that's what I look for. So it takes like 40 to 45 minutes if you're doing it right. Because you can't cook it on high heat. You got to cook it on low heat. So it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of attention. But then at just the right moment, when it smells right, when it looks right, when it's peanut butter in color, then go in the rest of the ingredients. And then from there, you're golden. It's going to be a good, it's going to be a good gumbo. So there's this just the right time moment. It's the same thing here. Sometimes I think we picture that our God is a distant God and that he's not involved. But let me tell you, he's involved. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. He says, but when the set time had fully come, the fullness of time, just the right moment. When it had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, 
born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, listen to this. Our God is not a distant God. Up until this point, up until the point of this fullness of time, he was involved with his creation. Since the banishment of humanity from the garden and from God's presence, he, God, was preparing the earth to receive his son. He wasn't just distant. He didn't just throw things out there and just walk away. No, he treated his creation like a good root. He stayed with it. He stayed involved. He watched it. He worked in it. And when the time was right, when the world was sufficiently ready, just as God had ordained it, heaven invaded earth. And not in the form of an emperor bolstered by a mighty army, but in the form of a baby wrapped in swaddling cloth, lying in a manger. The Jewish prophet Daniel, he saw this coming, literally. Some 600 years before Jesus was born, Daniel was living in exile under Babylonian oppression. And in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, we're told about a dream that Daniel had and that he needed to be interpreted. Usually Daniel was the one interpreting dreams. But he needed this dream interpreted for him. And so God revealed to him this dream and what it meant. And in those dream, in that dream, there were four kingdoms that would rise up on the earth and come into power. Those four kingdoms have since been interpreted to be the following kingdoms in succession. First, we have the Babylonian Empire. That's who was ruling and reigning and oppressing the Jewish people at the time that Daniel had this dream. And then the Babylonian Empire was conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire. And the Bible tells us that the Persian Empire also ruled and reigned and oppressed the Jewish people. And then the Medo-Persian Empire was conquered by Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire. And the Greek Empire ruled and reigned over and oppressed the Jewish people. And then came the Roman Empire. And in the dream, this fourth kingdom was bigger and stronger than the other kingdoms. It was the, represented the Roman Empire, and it came and conquered the Greek Empire, ruled and reigned over and oppressed the Jewish people. But then there was a fifth kingdom that Daniel saw. And this kingdom was given by God to the Messiah, to the Savior of the world. And the kingdom of the Messiah would be an everlasting kingdom. And Daniel was told that the Messiah would be given authority over everything in heaven and on earth, over every kingdom. And it would be an everlasting kingdom. Daniel chapter 7, that dream, it foreshadowed the fullness of time. This very moment that we're celebrating today, when God would usher in the everlasting kingdom through the birth of Jesus, who is the Messiah. And the when and where of Jesus' birth were not a random accident. God had in mind the time and the place of the birth of Jesus, even while he was in the garden, when he placed enmity between the serpent and between Eve's seed. After Adam and Eve had fell to the temptation, to the trickery of the serpent, God came on the scene and he told the serpent that you're going to strike her seed's heel, but he is going to crush your head. Even in that moment, God had the birth of Jesus in mind. Now think about this. Think about how many faithful men and women of God hoped for and believed in and longed to see the coming of this Messiah. Abraham, who God called out of his homeland, had faith that God would bless the nations, all of the nations, through his seed. But Abraham never lived to see that come to pass. David, 
King David had faith that God would raise up an everlasting king from his line. But David didn't live to see that come to pass. Moses, he didn't get to experience the coming of the Messiah. Queen Esther, she didn't get to experience it. Ruth, she didn't get to experience it either. The prophets of old, the ones who even talked about and foretold the coming of Christ, the Messiah, they didn't get to see it either. Why? Because the fullness of time had not yet come. It wasn't time. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And I want to tell you something, friends. God always shows up on time. He always shows up on time. Now, sometimes it might feel like he's late. Like he's not showing up on our timing. Like, and we're sitting there thinking, okay, God, any time now, I could really use you. I needed you yesterday. Where are you? And sometimes we might even just feel like God's not there at all. Like, are you going to show up? I thought you were for me. Now, even though we might feel like that sometimes, and I know I have, God always shows up, and he's always on time. It may not happen quite the way we expect it, but we can rest assured. God always shows up, and he's always on time. So that thing that you've been praying for, or that person that you've been praying for, or the deliverance that you're expecting in your life, and maybe you're just in here and you're just barely hanging on, don't give up hope. Because God always shows up. And he's always on time. You might not get to see that thing you've been praying for come to pass. But God always shows up. And he's always on time. You might not get to see that person that you've been praying for be delivered or saved or come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But God always shows up and he's always on time. If you do get to see it, it might not look like you expected. But God always shows up and he's always on time. Something else. I want you to know in Christ, God offers us what the world cannot. In Caesar Augustus, there were these promises of peace. There were promises of the forgiveness of sin. Can you believe that actually they wrote about Caesar Augustus having the ability to wipe away sin? There were promises of the forgiveness of sin. There were promises of salvation for the entire world. But in the end, Caesar could not deliver on those promises. The Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, ended just 200 years after it began. Now, 200 years might seem like a long time to us, but in the, the grand scheme of things, it's a blip on the radar. Caesar had no power to forgive sin, and therefore he had no power to offer salvation to the world. For one reason, really, and one reason alone. He was not God. Even though they worshipped him as if he was God, and even though he believed he was a son of the gods, he was not God. And the truth is, the world would have us believe that it can give us everything we need. Just look at all the advertisements and the commercials and everything that are going on during the holiday seasons, right? Right? If the world could really give us everything that we need, why is it that it's always pushing on us from every angle the need for the next best thing, right? The need for that newer electronic device that's just going to make my life better, right? Or the new appliance in my kitchen that's really going to solve all of my problems, right? It's going to do everything for me. It's going to make my roux for me. Wow. No. The car that drives itself. What about a smarter house? Or the world pushes us towards new relationships, right? New relationships. So I don't have to work on the one that I'm currently in. 
And I, I was thinking about it last night. It's like, it's as if the world knows that it can't really give us what we need. So it's constantly trying to entice us to believe that it can. If the world really could give us everything we need, why are so many people searching to find their purpose in this life? There's a question that's searched over 5,000 times on Google each month. The question is, what is my purpose in life? So 60,000 times a year, which may not seem like a lot, 60,000 times a year, people are searching, what is my purpose in life? I bet that's just a small fraction of the actual people who are asking themselves that question or asking that question and not punching it in to Google. This is an indication that people feel like something is missing in their lives, like there's this void that they can't fill. And they certainly can't fill it with anything that the world has to offer. And maybe that's you this morning. Or maybe you know somebody who's like that, searching for something to fill a void. Well, if you're here this morning and that's you, I'm glad you're here. You came to the right place because that void that you're longing to fill and that so many other people across the globe are longing to fill, guess what? It's a God-shaped void. It's God-shaped. Only he can fill it, and there's only one way that it can be filled. Through the birth of Jesus, God revealed the stark contrast that exists between heaven and earth, that exists between light and darkness. So while Caesar Augustus, who, remember, was ruling at the time of Jesus' birth, while he claimed to be a son of the gods, Jesus is the son of God. While Caesar claimed to be the forgiver of sin, Jesus is the forgiver of sin. And while Caesar claimed to be the bringer of peace, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. You know what's great, though? Jesus isn't just the Prince of Peace. He's the missing piece. Jesus is the missing piece. He is the answer to the God-shaped void. And that begs a question. What are we going to do with him? What are you going to do with Jesus? Who are you going to choose? Will you continue to try to fill that void with Caesar or Jesus? With the world or with Christ? Now, when we choose Jesus, we receive peace. And this peace that we receive from Christ is not like the peace that the world promises to give. Oftentimes when we think about peace, we think about the absence of conflict or this inner state of tranquility. But that's not the type of peace that Jesus is offering. The type of peace that Jesus is offering comes from the Hebrew idea of peace, which comes from the Hebrew word shalom. And that word means wholeness. Jesus is offering us wholeness. When we choose Jesus, we are choosing to be made whole. We are choosing to receive shalom. When we choose Jesus, we receive hope. When we receive hope through the forgiveness of our sins, the salvation of our souls. When we choose Jesus, we are choosing to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we're doing that with all that we have, with all that we are, because God first loved us. When we choose Jesus, we are choosing joy. Even in the midst of chaos, we are choosing joy by choosing Christ. Jesus was born into the midst of chaos. Chaos is all around us. 
But when we choose Jesus, we can have joy even in the midst of it. Only when we choose Jesus can our God-shaped void be filled. The real king has come. The real king has come. He is the God-man, and his name is Jesus. He was born into our world, and he longs to be born in our hearts. Will you choose Jesus this Christmas? If you've never made that decision to place your faith in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, maybe today represents the fullness of time for you. Maybe today is just the right moment. And I don't want to get in the way of that. So I want to offer anyone in here who hasn't yet placed their faith in Jesus as their Savior and Lord an opportunity to make that confession this morning. And the way that we talk about it here, it's simple. It's the ABCs. The ABCs of salvation. We admit that we are sinners, that we don't have it all together. We believe that God sent Jesus, his son, to die on a cross for our sins. And then he raised him from the dead to conquer death on our behalf. And then we see, commit, we commit our lives to following Christ, to living in a way that point people to him. So if you're ready to make that decision this morning, I want to give you the opportunity. So let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. And if today represents the fullness of time for you, if you feel like today is the day, it's just the right time that you're going to commit your life to Christ, then on the count of three, I would just ask that you would raise your hand. One, two, three. Three. Amen. Praise God. Would you pray with me? And if you made that decision this morning, I would just ask that you would pray along with this prayer. You could do it out loud or do it inside. That's okay. And if you've already made that decision, then feel free again to, to pray it, to follow along. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. I admit that I am a sinner. That I don't have it all together. But I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sins. And I believe that you raised him from the dead to conquer death for me so that I can live forever with you. And now I commit my life. I commit to following after you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you will bow your heads and reflect on this prayer written by Rebecca Jordan. Heavenly Father, your name is so called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. As your children, we cry out for a fresh filling and a new awareness of who you are. We choose by faith to make the good news of great joy a reality in our own lives, so others can see us as lighted trees of life, pointing, you this, pointing to you this Christmas. We know one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord, and we also know that peace on earth can only come when hearts find peace with you. You are still our joy. You are still our peace. You are no longer a babe in a manger. You are Lord of lords and King of kings. And we still celebrate you as Lord this Christmas and always. Amen. Amen. Right, you guys would stand. We're going to sing joy to the world. <laughs> That's going to be good. All right. Here we go. Just say.
Amen. Don't go yet. Stay right there, sir. We are done, but I do have a surprise, so you stay standing. So we have a Christmas present for every household here. So if you're going to be spending time with some other, of the other families that are here, you know, I know we got, a lot, we got a lot of families in the house tonight, or tonight, <coughs> this morning. It's not a candlelight service. See, it's got me messed up, too. We have Christmas presents under the tree up here. I would like to send one home with each household. But again, if you're going to be spending time with multiple households together, then just send someone up. Right, and I'll give you a Christmas present for just that household. There's some interactive, fun stuff to do together as a family around the table um, tonight or around the Christmas tree in the morning, however you would like to do it. But it's going to be fun. You're going to enjoy it. And we're just so thankful for you guys for coming. And we want to just give this as a gift for you. Merry Christmas.